Good afternoon and welcome to the Art Museum of West Virginia University. I'm going to give a few minutes for people to find their seats in the galleries and for those of us who are joining us virtually to log in and we'll start the presentation in just a minute or two. So thank you all very much. All right, and the numbers have kind of stopped clicking up online and the folks who are here in the galleries um, have their seats. Um, so we'll uh, move on from the awkward silences and go ahead and, and get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Zach Fowler is a service associate professor of biology at WVU, and he is also the director of the Arboretum of the core Arboretum, where he maintains the Arboretum and also does a lot of their public outreach. I know a lot of people who are here today and joining online have had the opportunity to enjoy this tremendous resource in our community. And as I invited Zach, one of the things that struck me was how both of our positions are about community resources and inviting people in um, who are not necessarily affiliated with the university. And I'm really happy to have this interdisciplinary moment here today. Uh, a few notes for those joining online. We do have closed captioning services available. So if you'd like to avail yourself of that, you can just click the button on your Zoom feed. Also, I will be monitoring the chat. There will be time for Q&A afterwards. We ask that you enter into the Q&A function. If there's any technical difficulty with sound or feed, you can put that in the chat. But a question for Zach, if you put that in Q&A, especially after his presentation, I will um, repeat it into the microphone. For those of you who are here in person during the Q&A, just so you know, I will um, take your questions and then repeat them into the microphone so that the virtual audience can hear them. All right, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Zach. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Uh, thanks everybody for coming here and, and thanks everybody for joining online. Um, I'm happy to do this and, uh, and uh, happy to, uh, to, to, to be here in the museum and, um, and uh, as, as Heather mentioned, uh, most of my work is, is at the Arboretum, which is very close here to the museum. It's just up the street and, and across the boulevard. And, uh, and uh, in a way, the Arboretum is a museum as well. It's sort of a tree museum. And, and uh, partially, it's, part of it is a true Arboretum, a museum of, of planted specimen trees. And a big part of it is sort of a, a, um, a, uh, a museum, a landscape museum, a museum about what it would have been like had Morgantown never been here. And a, and a good chunk of our 90 acres we maintain as a as an old growth forest preserve. And it is sort of a museum of what it would be like had, had Morgantown never been here. So, so Heather's right, um, the, the missions of, of the Art Museum and the Arboretum are, are quite similar actually, in, in, that, in that it's a place for people to come and, and publicly enjoy things that, that, uh, that they might not have access to at their home, you know? Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about art. I'm definitely not uh, an art historian and I don't really have a background in, in art history or anything like that. I do like art. I do have, you know, favorite artists and I'm into art. I love art museums. I, I try to seek art museums and, when I when I travel and stuff like that, you know, and so it's not that um, it's not that I don't like art or don't appreciate it. It's just that I've never had any really formal training in, in art history or or art or kind of kind of stuff like that, you know. Um, but uh, but I do have a lot of training in 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 biology and in, in natural sciences, um, both from a uh, both in a formal academic education setting and in sort of a, just what I like to do with my spare time, you know, I really try to like learn all the plants and bugs and birds and mushrooms and everything in nature, you know, and so. And so in a way, um, uh, particularly when I look at landscape paintings and, and nature paintings, it's hard to not be, it's hard to not take that sort of the way that I've studied nature outside into, into that, you know, and I'll talk about that in, in a second here. But, um, but first of all, before I get into all that, um, a little bit about um, just what a weird year it's been for, for art and for nature, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of fitting that here we are with art and nature kind of colliding indoors, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a very strange year for both art and nature, you know, in a way, um, uh, people have really turned to nature because of the, 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 the safety of being outside and, and people have really flocked to places like the Arboretum and, 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 and nature places. And at the same time as people have turned away, not willingly, but because they had to from place, indoor places like this, where people came to, to appreciate even nature art, you know, and so, and so it's become a, it's become a weird, it's become a, a weird thing for both places, you know, some places that are na natural places are being overused and, and just, just 
love to death almost, you know. And of course, the art museums are are are, are hoping that people will come, are going to come back soon, you know. And and hopefully, this kind of thing is 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 a return to to hopefully a return to to getting back inside, you know. And when I first when I first viewed these paintings to do this, I I, I did it online, you know. And that's that's just kind of like, but I'm, I'm tired of that, and I want I want to come back to this. So hopefully, this is hopefully this is the sign of of better things to come. Um, but uh, but uh, and and hopefully people keep coming outside, you know. Not not maybe not. Maybe not to the extent that, that things are overwhelmed, but but hopefully we find a natural, a good balance, and, and people come back inside and people stay outside and everything um, goes on. But um, but anyway, so so back to the art and 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 how I sometimes view art as a as a naturalist, and and um, I have a tendency when when there is nature in art, particular particularly art that's supposed to be of this region, to try to botanize in the painting, you know, and look in there and see if I can see. Um, things that I recognize are there are there are there plants that you can identify in 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 the art you know, and um, that doesn't mean they have to be um, exact representations of it you know in fact in fact one of my one of my favorite artists and some of my favorite some of several of my favorite artists kind of use this way where they capture um, species identity and the actual like identity of a plant or an animal without painting it photorealistically exactly like it looks you know. In fact, um, there's an artist, Charlie Harper, that, that you probably might know about. He's a, he's a West Virginia he's a West Virginia artist, and he does these almost cartoon level representations of of natural subjects. But they look very you can identify the species in them without a doubt, you know. Um, and and even sometimes at the at the landscape level, there are artists that can capture that species identification because a lot of species identification isn't you don't have to hold the leaf in your hand. You can do it by by the gestalt or sort of the the way a tree is present or the way it grows and branches and sort of how it looks, you know. In fact, you can. Do a lot of tree ID at a, at a long distance, and so um, and so sometimes artists can capture that in a painting, and, and sometimes they don't even try to, and that's okay, you know. Um, but that's but that's sometimes some of the stuff that I look for in paintings. And so when I looked at these paintings, I, I kind of started from that perspective, and um, the, and there was kind of like a, I noticed a couple of sort of divisions, and, and not being from an art history perspective, I, I kind of understand them a little better now that after I after I talked to Heather a little bit and looked into a little bit more into the the background of some of these artists, but um. But I kind of noticed the contrast between a painting like this and, and a painting like like this, and 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 in my mind, a painting like this kind of looks um, this looks real, you know. This looks like you could see some hemlock trees in there and some rhododendron, and and um, you know they, they they're not like painted like an exact hemlock tree, but they definitely look like hemlock trees and rhododendron, you know. And so and so and so um, this looks like somewhere that you would really like happen upon in West Virginia, and it's not exactly represented photorealistically, but it definitely has that sort of proper feel to it, as opposed to something like, like this, which, in, which is, which is um, theoretically in West Virginia even. This is along the Ohio River. There's another one on this wall over here where you, you can't see from where you're sitting, but a couple of them that are theoretically um, in West Virginia, but they somehow, they don't quite look like West Virginia, you know? It kind of is like, it's too grand. It's too like, the light is wrong. It's almost like there's something about it that's just like, that's just like, um, overwrought or like or, or you know and, and so and so um and it turns out that there's a whole there was a whole movement in 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 american painting um the hudson hudson river school right or hudson hudson river school or hudson valley school one of the two and it was um it was started by uh an artist who is actually has a painting over here on the wall but a really small painting over there thomas cole and and they kind of part of one of the defining features of their work was this they tried to capture um the sublime or this like large element of nature, you know, whether for, to kind of show, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the mid, the late, mid to late 1800s, you know, really weird time in, in, in the history of America. And there was kind of this like, um, they were figuring out their relationship with nature and, 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 and whether it was something to be dominated or, or appreciated or, or how, it was to be, how it was to be approached, you know. And so, and so in a sense, these paintings that are, that are like big and bold like that are, they're, they're capturing, um, that's kind of the landscape, the essence of it, you know, and, and, and that's something that science does often too, you know. Um, my, my background academically is in, is in biogeochemistry or, or nutrient cycling in forests. And so we look at how, um, how inputs of, uh, how things like inputs of nitrogen from acid rain affect the way soils work and trees grow. And to do that, you don't really look at individual species of plants. You look at like plants as a group, you know, and like, and you kind of, you say so you kind of do similar things in science where you kind of generalize and, and try to capture the essence of something without actually capturing the, the the literal details of it, and I think that's kind of what's happening here in these paintings, where they were kind of capturing this this grand essence of nature rather than than the true scene, you know. Um, and then, uh, 
some of the other paintings, um, like this this wintry one, I feel like that one actually does. You can you can see a spruce, you can see a birch tree in there. You know that is actually a the the, the colors are a little bit artistic, but it's it does very much. You can kind of botanize into that painting. You know it's it, to some degree. You know there does really kind of capture the true essence. And so you know you can kind of see a difference between these two and, and, and this one. And and um and there are several like this. There's one here. There's one over there. And there's one over there. And then some of the other ones. Um, some of the more, some of the more like like woodcut ones, um, they're of a of a different landscape. You know, they're more of a western scene. You know, and it's it's kind of, I kind of have more difficulty uh, botanizing into those because I'm more of an Appalachian Appalachian botanist, and most of my um, study of nature is 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 in this region. You know, and so I would expect to feel out of place in, in one of those in one of those paintings. But but in a painting that is of the Ohio River, which is kind of where I grew up, or, or I would expect to like feel at home, you know, <laughs> and I definitely don't, don't feel at home in that, in that painting, you know, whereas I do in this one or in that one. Um, and, uh, and I think part of that has to do with just sort of the, um, the, the intent perhaps of the, of the artist, but also because of the, uh, maybe even of their, maybe even of their sort of, um, they, maybe they weren't even botanists to start with, you know, and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't try to even capture that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that it was, it was, a uh, it was a great learning experience for me to, to do this. I, I think that the, um, the, uh, the, the whole sort of discomfort that these paintings gave to me was, was good inspiration to learn that sort of how that, how that came about, how that sort of unnatural sort of element came into them. You know, it's almost like, um, some of you may be familiar with, uh, Another artist, uh, he's, he's more of a pop artist, but this guy Thomas Kincaid that does these landscape paintings with like the glowing houses and stuff, you know? These almost feel like that to me. I don't know, that's probably, that's probably rude to say, but they kind of do, like it kind of has that, it kind of has that feeling to me where it's just like, that's almost like, it's so like glowing and wild and blah, it's just like, it's almost like scary that it's so like perfect, you know? So, um, you know, yeah, I think that that's kind of a, it's probably the best way that I can get it across to, to somebody who understands art, how it makes me feel, you know? <laughs> but uh, it does kind of, it does kind of, it's kind of not necessarily off-putting, but it does feel like um, not, not home, you know? Uh, any, any questions about any of that? Or are there any questions online or? There are no questions yet, but one thing that we talked about when we, um, and I'm trying to make sure I'm on the microphone here, one thing that we talked about when you came in toward the exhibition was the, the human relationship to the environment. And uh, you talked about um, conservation and how the Arboretum is in some ways a tree museum. And uh, I'm just interested in your take on, um, on the kind of human impact on environments like this and how maybe uh, your work and the, what's going on in these paintings is, um, uh, relates to, con to ideas and concepts of conservation. Sure, yeah. Um, I feel like uh, some of, the, some of the, the Hudson River School stuff was actually directly tied to conservation, you know, and it turned out that, that, um, that Thomas Cole um, was, a, was, a very, was a very strong conservationist, and some of his, the stuff that he did was almost like, like he, he took these paintings and he would paint like a series of them, where one was like the wild state, and then one had some civilization coming into it. And then one was like fully civilized. And then one was like the collapse. And then one was like nature returns, you know? And so it was almost like, um, it was almost a warning aspect to some, of, to some of Thomas Cole's stuff, you know? And it was like, it was intentionally like a little bit scary at the beginning. And then like, kind of like, and so, um, and so there's definitely a thread of conservation in the, and even the ones that I kind of was a little bit, didn't find myself attracted to once I looked into it, some of them do, but, but, but just by the same thread, some of them also, have this almost like manifest destiny element to them, you know, where it feels like it feels like they sort of portray nature as this wild, uninhabited. Um, um, from a human perspective, that's a little rude, you know, that it wasn't necessarily this wild, uninhabited landscape. It was perhaps, you know, there were there were people already there. It wasn't it wasn't like it was it wasn't like it was this wild landscape to be to be completely um, to be completely. Uh, taken over as your destiny, you know? And so, um, and so uh, from a human conservation perspective, it's, it's, there is some, some, uh, some awkwardness to it sometimes too, but I don't understand all that, you know? And I don't, I don't really understand where 
these painters fall on that perspective and everything like that. I do know that it is there a little bit. It was a weird time in history, you know, and, and, and a lot of people weren't, weren't, even John Muir, you know, wasn't, wasn't immune from, from that kind of stuff, you know, and so it is a little bit of a, there's some awkward stuff there from a human perspective. From a nature conservation perspective, I think that um, nature art and having uh, art indoors, particularly art that doesn't exactly, exactly capture nature, but it captures it in an interpretive sense that, that, that sort of captures elements of nature that people can latch onto in a way that, that isn't an exact, maybe like a photograph, you know, something that you couldn't have taken with your cell phone, but something that somebody had to create that, that captures some element of nature that makes you think about how you interact with nature or think about how your future with nature might be. Um, I think that stuff is really important for conservation because, um, because, uh, because that's how people who don't spend time outside in nature are going to form their concepts of nature in some ways, you know, and there are a lot of people who, who prior to something like the pandemic might have much rather go to the art museum than to the Arboretum, you know, and for those people, there's, there's important communication that, 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 that they can take from art, just like we can take from nature, you know? Yeah, and I think there are several things in what you just said. I mean, we did talk a little bit about one of the things that we felt was really important here, based on what you were saying about the, the, um, the false idea that these um, that these people in the 1800s were the first people on this land. It was really important for us to make sure that the um, Native American Studies land acknowledgement is on the wall here and to kind of talk about that and enter into those critical conversations with students and classes so that we could both think about what the painters were trying to do, right? but also think about how that fits into a larger context. and. Um, <clears throat> and a context that, as you, you said, is complicated and in many ways problematic. Yeah. Um, you, um, I'm so interested in, the, the, I keep going back to this tree museum that you were saying yeah. about the, the Arboretum being there as an, an idea of an old growth forest. How do you, um, how do you figure out that information? How do you share that with people? Like, well, I'm interested in the idea of interpretation. Like, how do you kind of take people back in time in the tree museum? Yeah, um, well, a lot of it is done. Uh, it's, you don't really have to go back. It's not about going back in time. It's about, it's about and that's a good, I, I, I see what you're saying, is how do you make people realize that, that you're in a different time. But in a sense, um, it's not so much about going back in time. It's about, it's about having not done something that we did, you know? And so it's about like, it would be like this everywhere. It's not like we're going back in time. It's like we're in the present, but we're in a different present than what we could have been in had we done something differently, you know what I mean? And so it's not so much about, and in a way it is about going back in time because things have been so steady for the last several thousand years that like, it's a lot like going back in time, but it's also like going into an alternate present, you know? Absolutely. And I think I'm also interested in this kind of, as we've talked about, false dichotomy that is set up between the kind of indoor and outdoor appreciation <laughs> of nature and what the pandemic has made us think about that. Um, I mean, what would your, if you were to bring a class of biology students here, what would you um, hope that they would get from the experience of nature inside uh, versus what they're able to get when they do kind of field work with you outside? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think I would probably do something, you know, based on the way that it, I would, it would totally be based on my understanding and my ability to, to do it, you know, and so I'll do something kind of probably similar to what I did. I would ask them to to try to identify um, some plants and some of the, the paintings if they could, and uh, to try to identify places that made them feel like they were at home in a natural area, and ones that didn't, and why they might not have, you know, and it's not, and explain, and kind of help them understand that it wasn't bad to not feel at home in a painting that was supposed to be from somewhere that you were, but there might have been a different intent, you know, and it was like, what was the intent, or like try to understand how it was that this, this painting that somebody obviously painted of a place that is where you are, um, how did it end up not looking like that? You know, so there, I think there, there would be great lessons yeah. one. Wonderful, and that's one of the things we try to do too. We work with classes from all over the university. So I'm always open if you want to have one of those, <laughs> <laughs> I want to have one of those conversations. Yeah. Yes, Todd has a question. Um, you mentioned John Muir a little bit. Can you sort of share some more about our understanding of John Muir today through the last few years? Maybe how that translates into what we're doing now and what we're Yeah, I, uh, so I'm going to repeat that for okay, the people in the, for the people virtually. So Todd said that Zach mentioned John Muir, and he wanted to, uh, Zach to elaborate a little bit more about um, his understanding of John Muir and how understandings of him have changed in the past couple of years. Again, this is something that we have 
some wall text here on the gallery addressing um, John Muir's history as a conservationist, but also some of his um, racist views that have been uh, acknowledged by the Sierra Club. So I'll let you kind of jump in on that as well, Zach. Yeah, it's a, it's a touchy subject and I'm, I'm not an expert on it. So I really kind of hesitate to say too, too much because I don't want to, um, to, 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 wrongly, uh, to wrongly either cast John Muir in the wrong light or, or to, 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 make too much of, to make too much of something that I, that I don't really know a whole lot about. But I do know that, that John Muir, um, he kind of came into, into being as a conservationist right at, in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, you know. One of, his, one of his first writings is this book called A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf. It's, it's a really cool book. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, he, was, he was working in a, in a mill in the, some kind of industrial place in the, in the Midwest and he almost, he almost lost an eye and he gave up on that and he walked across the country right after the Civil War to the Gulf of Mexico and wrote this account of it. And, um, and uh, in, in that and in other writings of his, you know, there are, there are ways he described um, other people that are just rude and awful, you know, in ways that we wouldn't do now. And it's not really, it's not really forgivable, but it, it, even in the context of, of all the great things that he did, you know, and so there is that, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't know what to say about, about some of that other than that, like um, some of these people, um, were, were on the wrong path for some reason, you know, in, in some aspects of their life, even though they were on a really good path in other aspects of their life. And, and I'm sure that's like that now with a lot of people too, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think that one of the things we hope to do as an art museum is kind of engage that complexity and not cast ideas or people fully aside, but kind of engage all of that. Yeah. Um, and and it's, a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, yeah. thing, it's a tricky thing to do. Yeah. Um, is there, a, does anyone else in the audience or in the virtual audience have any questions? I feel like we've kind of entered into almost a dialogue mode and I really like Wonderful. that. Wonderful, it's fine. I yeah. really like that. So if there's anyone who would like to jump into the dialogue, um, we'd love to have you. Or I can keep coming up with questions for Zach. <laughs> So I'm interested, I see some, some folks here um, who are not familiar faces. We often get this, the same kinds of groups of people, people here. I'm interested if anyone's willing to share um, what drew them here and kind of what your initial impressions of being in the gallery space are, because I think people have some different backgrounds than, than maybe are typically in, the, in our galleries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for the people for <laughs> Yeah, so for, for my people at home, the, the, the core of the question was how did, how did this collaboration come about? And the short answer is that I wrote people into this. <laughs> I sent out cold emails to folks with all sorts of, but again, as a campus organization, one of, or as a campus institution, one of the things that's really important to us is to um, be a resource for the whole community. And I think that there's a feeling we're a relatively new art museum. We're only six years old, which in the span of art museum is pretty small. And um, I think that there's a, um, an idea sometimes that this is a place for art historians, it's a place for artists, and we do, we do tours for every art history professor and every, but we also work with business students to talk about nonprofits and leadership students, sociology, anthropology. So that's part of my job. And, um, and I'm really excited, especially in STEM fields, because I feel like there's often a disconnect where people feel like art doesn't uh, speak or to enter into dialogue with 
um, biology with chemistry and all of those things. So whenever I see an opportunity, so when we planned this exhibition and I was doing a programming, I knew also that Zach was a great educator and great scientist who could kind of bring that human aspect and that interdisciplinary as aspect, which is something I, and I appreciate you Thanks. saying yes and diving in. I don't know if you have anything you want to say about being I got an email. wrangled by me. I got an email. I was nervous about it, but it's, it's been really fun. So I did. <laughs> I'm happy that I did it, even though I was a little nervous. It was, it's been really fun. Yeah, but that's part of the reason I, I kind of ask people for their backgrounds and stuff. Like I said, I'm really excited to see folks who maybe haven't been here before or haven't looked at it in this way, who, um, and with different backgrounds, who can come with their fresh eyes and their eyes that speak from their own perspective um, about what is on our walls, because I think that's kind of the power of having different mediums yeah. to, to do that. Yeah. And I, that actually, um, Cindy O'Brien in the virtual chat asks, and this it actually kind of speaks to this exact issue, in what ways can a visit to the museum enhance a visit to the Arboretum? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> they uh, they're located very close to one another, and uh, and there's some exercise. You could you know you don't have to drive. You can well, you should walk from one to the other. So um, so you will get some exercise. Uh, you will get to access two of WVU's wonderful public resources in, in one day. That would be great. Um, but uh, there's um, on a really hot summer day in the Arboretum. I assume this place is much cooler than the Arboretum, so you can come here and cool up. There are a lot of ways, but but in a but in a real set to get to the real the real essence of it. Um, um, art and nature are linked in a way that that people aren't always approaching them for the true face value, the true actual what it is, you know. And so in both ways, you know, when you go to the Arboretum for nature. You're going there in a way to look at the birds and the plants and stuff, but you're also going there to get something bigger than that and soak in something much bigger that you can't quite put your finger on, but you're just kind of trying to get this big experience, you know. And the same thing happens in, a, in an art museum, you know. You're looking at the paintings, of course, and you're seeing the, the line and all that, but at the same time, there's something like bigger that soaks into you from it, and um, and uh, they're both similar in that respect, you know, and, and kind of in different directions. And so you can have like something like soak in that you don't realize in two different dimensions, you know. So so I would say yeah, that's it's a great way to do it. No, and I think. That's a wonderful way to talk about, you know, the, the search for something bigger and a place to contemplate that in different media, and different uh, different environments. Um, yeah. And uh, and I think it's interesting that we talked about the pandemic kind of maybe take, making some indoor people more outdoor people, and yeah. maybe some outdoor people are anxious now to have some indoor experiences. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. For so, sure, definitely. Um, are there yeah. any more questions from the audience? Are there any more comments? And so, so the um, the comment from the audience was that it really helps you to kind of see the painter's choices and kind of to analyze and think about the colors and textures if you see it in a painting and then you go out and I also think about frames. It's so interesting to take all of these landscapes, whether they're the vast ones or the more intimate ones and know that they're all contained within a frame that then when you're in an actual landscape, you're in a panorama and you see it all. And so that is another one of the painter's choices. Where have they chosen to focus their eye, focus their attention and why? And, you know, and I think you were talking about that a little bit with the kind of the, the vastness of some of these. Yeah. And how that almost didn't feel right to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little awkward. I'm almost uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It forces me to focus and, and to look at that. 
Yeah. And the and the comment from the audience again, and I'm sorry, I know it's a little awkward to repeat everything, but the comment from the audience was that she actually, in her experience as nature, sometimes creates her own frames with her hands to kind of focus herself as she walks through places and things. Um, so she does kind of frame it uh, because you are in this fast thing. It helps to focus focus you in. Yes, what were you going to say? I came here for. I was drawn for three reasons, like in the master naturalist program, and they take a syndrome arena and try to teach us to recognize trees from bark and twig patterns. Then I started a botanical illustration certification course, how we represent nature fairly accurately. And then I'm an ophthalmologist, and I'm drawn to why artists choose colors because of the retinal sensitivity and things like that. Um, so I came here yesterday because I wanted to see what was going on. And when I looked at it, I thought, what is Zach going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> because there, there's a lot of these, I think, are artists impressions or what they like your trick to look like, but it's slim pickings yeah. to pull out and identify this. So congratulations. <laughs> Take it this up a level. Well, that's <laughs> Yeah. Well, not to say I didn't, but <laughs> thank you. Well, this the speaker here has a diverse background in ophthalmology and um, what was it, illustration? Botanical, Botanical illustration. illustration. And so she was saying it's, it's actually really difficult to go through this gallery and be able to identify exact species and trees because there's so much artistic interpretation. So she was uh, giving Zach kudos and Zach's nodding. And again, it's one of these funny things like I look at it from an arts perspective and I don't have any real background in tree identification. So I, I have no idea if this is an accurate or an inaccurate thing. And so it's interesting to hear you all. It helps me to know something more about the artists to know how much interpretation is there. Yeah. Um, because I think um, we talk, I often talk about this gallery in um, contrast to some of the more abstract work that we have in other places and talk about this as being our very realistic and in the art world, certainly yeah. are realistic <laughs> landscape paintings, but they're not realistic yeah, from yeah. a botanical yeah. perspective. And I think that's an interesting. That's really funny to hear, to hear these referred to as realistic. It's like, it's a, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of, I, I get what you're saying. You know, they are realistic, you know, they're realistic representations of nature, but they are quite far from, from real, you know, at the same time, yeah. If I can switch goals for a second here, one of the questions that I have is, so we're talking a lot about the frame and the sort of romanticized view of nature, uh -huh. or even like going through nature and looking at things through frames in our hands. And I wonder, from a conservation perspective, what do you think that does to us as viewers, seeing the natural world from this very human-centric position? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, kind of discussion uh, about like even the validity of the human centric position. You know, and and should humans consider themselves centric in nature from a conservation perspective? You know, it, it, it's we're far from the most important organisms on the planet as far as keeping everything functioning. You know, and so. <laughs> And so, um, and so, but, but in a way it kind of, it almost reinforces the human centric perspective in a way, because it kind of like, it, it kind of like, um, it kind of uh, looking at, it kind of puts you outside looking in, you know, instead of, instead of like actually fully, fully immersed in, in the experience, you know, but, but, um, but at the same time, um, it's also how really important concepts of about nature are captured, you know, and like, and like non-human centric concepts about nature are captured and framed as well, you know, and so I can't say that it's like, it totally 100% reinforces that, but, it, but in some ways it kind of, it does take you out of the picture in a way, you know, to, to frame it, I would say. And that was, again, for the people at home, Jason was asking a question about the, the role of frames and kind of looking at a limited place as a, um, as kind of reinforcing the human centric 
uh, viewpoint. And I, I hope you were able to get that through Zach's answer. I'm doing my best, doing, do, I'm doing my best to, to repeat. Um, I have just a, a comment in the chat, and this is actually from Joy Ice, who's a uh, retired director of the Art Museum. Uh, but I think it's a kind of a beautiful way that encapsulates a lot of what both Zach and I have been trying to say. The concept of wilderness in the American mind has been written about by a number of people, a place to be tamed, domesticated, even feared, and as a place that is a refuge, retreat, and place of renewal. It seems to me that the art of these, the Appalachian landscape and the Arboretum reflect both of these aspects. Yeah. And I think that... Um, that is great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that that kind of puts all of these kind of tensions, you know, uh, Joy has, you know, tame, domesticated, feared, refuge, retreat, renewal, yeah. and those kind of tensions that we're holding and, and what the role of, of our institutions is and yeah. all of that and the kind of dialogues we can have in a, a, a teaching university and a teaching museum. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's great. It, it, and in a way, it's like um, it's one of my the favorite parts of my job, and I'm sure you enjoy it as well. Is is having this this role in an institution that is an educational institution, of course, but it's an educational. It's not necessarily. It's um. Most of the people that that sign up for our education are 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 paying students, of course, you know. But these 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 the art museum, the arboretum, and I'm sure there are other institutions like this at the university, the, the, the planetarium, and there are others at the university as well, but are places that are open to the public and we are educating everyone, just anyone that comes along and wants it and we're trying to get more people to come along. And it's, and it's, kind, of a, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a different uh, experience at a university level to be in that, that thing, but it's wonderful. And it's, it's a, very important, a very important thing that the university does. And, it's, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, this kind of thing really ties the two together. And it's, it's neat to think about it that way. You know? yeah. Well, I am so thankful to, to Zach well, for thanks. doing that. And, and I don't know if, if anyone has any last questions or comments, I'll take them. Oh, Todd has another one. Well, what kind of, what's the next kind of landscape painting? <laughs> oh, the, next, so, the next landscape painting? Okay, so Todd wants, to know, Todd wants to know what kind of landscape painting should we acquire? What would you, if you were, if you were on our acquisitions com committee, oh, what would no. I have to think about it. Um, yeah, no, yes, I'm talking, yeah, one of those nice cabins with glowing windows. <laughs> no, yeah, no, um, uh, I, you know, I don't, strangely enough, I'm less in, I guess not, probably not strange enough because I spend so much time out in landscapes that I'm less into landscape paintings than I am into like, kind of like some more, more detailed type paintings, you know, like my favorite artists are, like I said, like Charlie Harper, who does the, the kind of like detailed but cartoonish um, things that are, that are, intentionally not representations, intentionally not realistic representations, but capture the real essence of things, you know? And so I think that's something that, that may be that kind of thing, you know? And I'd be happy to work with, work with you all on something like that, where it's like, it's a, it's a painting that isn't, that isn't realistic at all. In fact, it's far from like, like the, 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 color, the colored painting over there, you know, but that one doesn't quite do it, but there are paintings that could be in that color, but still be, you could identify plants in them, you know what I mean? And that would be a really cool painting, a painting that was like, wild rainbow colors but was still the actual trees were identifiable by some means or something like that you know well, I think one thing that may be fun for the museum to take on as far as the party landscapes is West Virginia has the most diverse uh, botanical life in you know the, the northern part of the hemisphere so in Harvey County we have desert plants cranberry glades and rainforest uh dolly sods and more stuff you find in Canada and Alaska, and uh, maybe trying to get something for each of those oh, yeah. botanical spheres would be fun. So, that would be really cool. So, like a landscape scale natural history tour in art. <laughs> That'd be sweet. Yeah. And you're right. There's a lot of elevational and local differences and completely different. It wouldn't have to be a realistic representation, but like an artistic representation of this. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, and I think it's oh, one okay. more question. She's kind of back behind the wall. representation of what used to be species, either animal or plant or tree, that used to be, that is no longer, but in a current landscape setting. Mm. So I think the question is a little bit about time. And she said, I love the statement, art is not limited to what is. And that you all have made clear to me that the botanical yeah. representations here are not, but also talking about kind of 
how um, a landscape or representation might have some anachronisms in it, I think is what you're saying, like some yeah. uh, uh, maybe a plant or uh, an animal that no longer exists that then is placed in a more kind of like modern context. Yeah. I can't think of any artist who does that particularly. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's a really good question, actually. I think that, um, I think that it does kind of get at one of the conservation one of the probably unintended conservation values of art in a way, you know, because if you went back and looked at, um, I'm sure there were, you know, there's a, an artist, uh, um, this, will, this will be a good one to get. I, I just thought, Porta Crayon, Thomas Hunter Strother. He's, a, he's an early Appalachian, uh, they did, did like, like charcoal and stuff, but he was awesome. He would be an awesome, he'd be excellent to have some stuff like his. He was a little bit of a, he was kind of a hokey dude too. He did like, like kind of, kind of like, um, Kind of like comedy travel writing at the same time as he did this really awesome art but he was a really it was some really cool stuff but anyway some of his some of his early art was of the west virginia landscape canaan valley and such before the logging happened you know and so he depicted landscapes that that you know the entire state of west virginia has almost entirely been logged now and so any painting of it before that it captures a whole landscape that is gone now you know similarly with the similarly with the prairies of of the midwest you know the um the uh the, the the temperate grassland ecosystem in the midwest was at one point a good chunk of of our continent and now it's been entirely replaced by agriculture so any sort of early painting of the prairies and and the the life in the prairies before it was agriculture would be um certainly would be a look back in time you know and like and something that would be like wow what did we do with that you know and so um maybe something important but still yikes you know and so um and so yeah so you're right there are there are certainly time travel things where it's like wow we should have taken better care of that or you know um maybe we did that for an important reason but we still sad you know it's kind of stuff so that's a, that's a really, that's a really interesting question yeah. yeah it's funny that you say the midwest i did my phd at the university of illinois in urbana champaign and yeah. which is very much that kind of flattened agricultural landscape but yeah. similar to how you have the arboretum as a representation of an old growth for, forest they have a tall grass prairie yeah um that they that is like kind of in the middle of all of this being built up flat agricultural land but it's something that's there as kind of like a preservation and also as a time capsule yeah of what uh, of what that landscape was Absolutely. it's really it's also a really beautiful place to spend time <laughs> and, yeah. um one of our comments here actually is we're talking about the connections between the Arboretum and the Art Museum is also saying that the Arboretum can be a great place to go to get inspired to make art. So oh, should you be interested in your own kind of landscape paintings or photography or any of those things that the Arboretum has its own, uh, can be a place to kind of find that inspiration as well. Yeah, that's um, so awesome. So maybe I, I should bring an art class to the Arboretum and you should bring a bio class here Let's and do we it, can yeah. and, do and, some interdisciplinary learning. Yeah, and should and should any artist be inspired by the Arboretum, I would love to see their work. Be, yeah. That'd be really cool for me yeah. to see Arboretum inspired artwork. I'd be, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 or any of those large trees, uh, large pre-logging landscapes would be, yeah, would be like a time capsule to see. Um, of course, we'd have to understand that as a as an artistic representation of that, and it might have been somebody like this who didn't paint it anything like what it really looked like, you know. But but you know, who knows? You know, yeah, it's still important. <laughs> Well, I think that we're going to go ahead and wrap up, but the museum is now um, open to the public. We opened at 1230, which means that for all of you, especially if you haven't been here, we would love to invite you to spend some more time, identify some trees or not, <laughs> since you've done, um, but we'd love for you to spend some time in our galleries and we'll welcome you back. This is actually our last public program of the semester. Um, we will... Um, shut down uh, on December 12th for um, about a month, a little over a month. And then we'll, we, we will reopen with four brand new exhibitions and a new complement of public programs with new interdisciplinary connections. So please follow us on social media, check out our website because I would love to see some of you all back here. Um, I'd love to work uh, more with Zach on public outreach and public learning. And I thank you all for being here. I also like to send, extend my huge thank yous to Jason and Saeed who have helped us to have the audio so that those of you in the virtual world can hear us and can see us. 
Um, and throughout the semester, Jason has really helped us to create this hybrid environment so that we can be um, dually serve audiences virtually and in person. So I'm tremendously grateful for that. Thank you very much. And we hope that all of you have a um, wonderful winter season and we hope to see you in the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you.